So hello everyone and welcome to this week's video lecture series on the DC to DC converters and in this lecture we are going to continue with the SEPIC converter. So in the previous week we had stopped here where we had created the simulation for the SEPIC converter, we had written the, we had finished with the circuit schematic, we had written the control code, we had edited the circuit parameters and finally we had simulated to get this result that is in the file browser where we had checked that the output plot is at least a stable result. Right. Now, in this lecture, let's continue and analyze the results. So as before, before we start this lecture, a little bit of background. That is, if you are interested in these kind of video lectures, but you would like something a little more comprehensive, I do have a full length online course on simulating power electronic circuits using Python. So this is an entire online course available at the MOOC website Udemy. And in this lecture, I, or rather in this course, I cover almost all the topics related to simulating power electronic circuits, which is installing Python, how to use Python, how to install the circuit simulator, a little bit of basic theory about power electronics, and finally, a test case on simulating a buck converter. <coughs> if, however, you are interested more on the signal processing and the control aspect, I have another online course called Basics of Digital Signal Processing for Power Engineers, also available on the MOOC's website, Udemy. And in this case, I will be talking about how we can use Python for signal processing, specifically in applications for power electronics. So I talk about some basic theory about signal processing, about Python tools available for signal processing, and we also take a few case studies where we use Python to analyze the frequency response of filters and use this method to design filters. So anyway, with this, with this little bit of basic background, let me get started with this week's course. So first, let me plot the result again, because we may have a more detailed plot this time. The simulation is still running. Let's go over to the file browser and look at the output voltage plot. And you see that the simulation is pretty much completed and we have this plot, right? Now, of course, we can always go and zoom in a little because it's not too clear here. So let's zoom in between 4.5 and 5.5 to know exactly what value we are at. So if you take the X zoom of 4.5 to 5.5 and plot it, This should give us at least a good zoom on the value so that we can kind of at least verify the value that we expect. So let's go to the output plot and you see here. So we have a value of around, I would say around, if this is the midpoint of around 5.1, this is around 5.07 or 5.08. So let's go over to our step spreadsheet and let's verify. Now we have an input voltage of 12 volts and if you go to our editor, the duty ratio that we've chosen is a constant 0.3. So with this, of course, we can calculate the expected value of the output voltage, that is input voltage multiplied by D divided by 1 minus D, right? And this is pretty much common for most of these converters like the Chuck converter, the buck boost converter, and the separate converter because they are all working in the buck boost mode. So this gives us a voltage of 5.14 volts. This is the voltage we would expect for a duty ratio of 0.3. Now, this does not take into effect any of the drops in any of these components. We've taken parasitic resistances for all these elements, which is not included here. So therefore, we do expect a voltage slightly lower than this. And if you look, that's exactly what we're getting. If 5.14 is somewhere here, you're getting a voltage slightly lower than this. So I would say that this result is indeed accurate. So let's delete this, let's save it just to make sure we don't make any other changes and let's keep going. Now let's examine the other plots. So let's go over to our circuit schematic and check out what are the plots we need. So we have two inductors, inductor L1 and inductor L2, right? So the most important thing is, as always in any of these kind of converters is to plot these two inductor currents together. So let's do that. And we we'll call this inductor currents. Start the plot. 
there is ammeter L1 let's call this I1 save the waveform and then we can choose ammeter L2 call this I2 you don't have to put L because we know what it is and we can click on done so we have this new plot so this of course will be a very dense plot so it doesn't make much sense actually viewing it but still we can zoom in once we actually achieve the plot so we can stop the simulation because it's already complete let's go over to a file browser and see that this is indeed the plot we want so let us zoom in between 0 0.8 and 0 0.801 right? since it's a high frequency converter we do need a fairly smooth or a fairly short range so 0 0.8 to 0 0.801 plot the objective is to gradually start analyzing the performance which is why I'm going to start plotting variables one after the other and of course even this is not very clear because we do have fairly wide range so let us zoom in between minus 0.5 and 1 so I will choose the same x x range and I will choose a y range as well so let's look at the inductor current and it's much clearer now of course I could have actually reduced it a little more but anyway this is good enough so let's look at what's happening now we have the two inductor currents we have current inductor current I1 and inductor current I2 all right now actually quite strangely we see that the current I2 is larger than I1 anyway more on that later the first thing we need to see is we see that this these two currents are pretty much in sync right so when current I1 is increasing, current I2 is also increasing. Let's go over to our circuit and check what's happening. The current I1 will increase when the switch S1 is closed right? because then the voltage source is charging the inductor in this clockwise direction. When this happens, we have the capacitor charging the inductor L2 in the anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Right? So both the inductors therefore are charging because when the switch is turned on the voltage source discharges through the switch and the capacitor also discharges through the switch. So therefore both currents are expected to rise together and they do rise together. Right? So now the question is what's happening with this and when the switch is turned off they both fall together because when the switch is turned off the voltage source and the inductor will now discharge through the forward path right that is this forward path goes all the way through the output now since the current is since the energy in the inductor is indeed discharging the capacitor is charging but the inductor is discharging so the current is falling at the same time the diode begins to conduct because now current is flowing in the forward direction which means this inductor also discharges through the load so therefore both currents are discharging together Right. Now let's look at what's pos possibly happening with this current I2. Now what would determine what will be the magnitude of this current. Now let's look at this switch S1. The voltage source is discharging through the switch. So therefore this current I1 the mag or rather the change in this current I1 will de depend on this voltage source V, v in right? the magnitude of this voltage source because V divided by L will determine the di by dt right so therefore if you know the on time you know the di now let's look at what's happening here the voltage across this inductor is the voltage across the capacitor right and the voltage across the capacitor comes across this inductor so the di by dt of this inductor is determined by the voltage across the capacitor now Let's do a little bit of basic mathematics here. We already saw 
that the output voltage is around 5 volts. We know that the input voltage is around is 12 volts. It's a, we chose like a battery, right? 12 volt battery, which means in that case, the voltage across this capacitor is going to be 7 volts. So let's verify this so that we can know exactly what's happening here. Let's me close this for a minute. Let me go back to my web browser and create another plot. And let's call this capacitor voltage. Start the plot. And we shall call this voltmeter C1. Call this VC. Save the waveform. And click on done. So let me go and plot this. And let me go to the web browser, file browser, and you see that we do have a voltage in this VC which is around 12 volts itself. So let's go and find out what's going on. Let's zoom in a little between 10 and 15. And plot this. And this is the capacitor voltage and you see that the voltage across this capacitor is also 12 volts right now the question here is what exactly is going on right we have rather let's go back to the circuit we have an input voltage which is 12 volts we have a capacitor voltage which also appears to be 12 volts and we have an output which is 5 volts. All right. So the question here is what exactly is going on? When this switch is turned on, in that case, it is only this capacitor that is the diode, the output is completely cut off from the rest of the circuit because this diode is, this diode does not conduct. When the switch is turned off, the diode conducts and we have a voltage in the forward direction. So we have 12 volts, we have another 12 volts here and we have a capacitor voltage of around 5 volts. Now the question here you might ask is how exactly is this even possible? Right? The reason why this is possible is because of the disconnected nature of this of this DC to DC converter. Right? Now before we actually go into the rather the transient nature and we'll look at that very soon. What is important to understand is the equations that actually matter. So let's look at the equations. The voltage source here has a drop across this inductor. There is a drop across the capacitor and you can say the drop across the diode is pretty much negligible. The drop across this inductor always appears. Right? That is what's important. The drop across this inductor is always going to appear. Now, which means that when this switch is turned off in the forward direction, it's not just the voltage source and the capacitor that matters. Remember, both the voltage source and the inductor are now discharging through the capacitor, which means that this inductor voltage also comes into the forward path. Right? The voltage source is 12 volts, the capacitor is 12 volts, but we have to take into account that there is an inductor voltage here as well. This inductor voltage is what accounts for this additional 5 volts. And I would say that you could consider placing a voltmeter across this and measuring the voltage for yourself. And you will see that of course this voltage is changing, so it's not a constant voltage, but the average voltage over the off time of the switch will indeed be 5 volts. That's what accounts for it. But now the question then arises, how is the inductor current in such a way? This capacitor and this voltage, we have seen that they are now very analogous in terms of voltage, right? Now the question now arises, what happens to this inductor current and how, how these two inductor currents are different? Now. Remember, the voltage source, when it is applied across this, across this switch, produces, 
it produces a charging a charging effect on this inductor right similarly when this switch is turned on this capacitor charges this inductor the question arises both of these will now be a similar effect the reason is because the voltage sources are almost similar right we have seen that the input voltage is 12 volts we know because we've chosen it as a parameter and we know that the capacitor c1 also has a voltage of 12 volts so now let's see what happens when it discharges when it discharges when the switch is off the forward path is on the voltage source is now against this capacitor and against this output right now the question arises what is therefore the net voltage here the net voltage across this is the voltage source v in minus capacitor voltage so it's pretty much zero and this output voltage right so basically the output voltage appears in, across this inductor in a negative way and that's why the current through this inductor drops rather falls similarly this inductor also faces the same effect right so therefore the difference between these two inductors really speaking is just the parent resist or rather the uh, parasitic resistances in these two parts because really speaking the voltages across them are very close right the voltage across them are very very close so this is a case where the two inductor currents are as such very complementary similar to it's it's you could say similar to a chuck converter but the most important thing is unlike a chuck converter where the inductor was in the forward direction the diode was in the reverse direction there was a huge difference between the two currents right if you go back and review the chuck converter there was a huge difference between the current current through i1 il1 and the current through l2 and that current was accounted by the current through the capacitor but in this case that is not this that is not the case for the sake of our own simulation i would say that in the next lecture let us change this duty ratio and verify this for ourselves so once again as i said i do not want these lectures to get too long so therefore i will stop this lecture now in the next lecture we will continue our analysis so as before if you have any doubts about what i talked about please do post in the comments or <clears throat> send me an email or message me on social media whichever is your preference otherwise i will see you in the next week where we will continue with this video lecture series so thank you so much for watching goodbye for now